Okay, welcome everybody. Come on in. Thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Brandon Minnick, and in this session, we're talking about how to correct common mistakes in async and await. Now, I am so excited to be here with you today because this is a talk that I actually made back in 2018, gave it for the first time at NDC Sydney. So it's super cool to come all the way back to Copenhagen and deliver it, but there's been a lot more cool stuff added to .NET since 2018. So it was an hour talk back then. It's about an hour and a half talk now that we're just going to cram into an hour. So I'm going to move fast. But the good news is I've got a link down here on the slides. You'll see this link. You'll see this QR code. Takes you to the same place. This is where you can find everything that we're going to talk about today. So we've got some open source code. All of that's up on GitHub. You can find it at that website. That's where you can find the slides. You can even find the recording from, I also did this talk at NDC Oslo a couple years ago as well. So don't worry about trying to take notes. Don't worry about trying to keep up. Don't worry about trying to memorize anything, because we've got a lot of stuff to cover. And it's all there for you. So make sure to grab a picture of that QR code. And feel free to share it with friends and coworkers who maybe couldn't be here today. But let's get rolling. So we're going to start by looking at this method. This is an async task method called redata from URL. And yes, I made this <laughs> six years ago. So it's a little out of date. But if you ignore the fact that we're using web client, because yes, today you should be using HTTP client. You should never new up a new HTTP client inside a method. That should be static. You should be reusing them. We've got HTTP client factory now. But we're still using it in this example just because you'll see in a bit we dive real deep into this code, and these are really complex slides that take a lot of work to put together. But what we're doing here is we are newing up a, a web client. We're calling download data task async. We're returning that as a byte array called result, en encoding that into a string data, and then passing that to a method called load data. Now, what's really going on here with, with async await, with multi-threading, is that the first thread is going to call this chunk of code. So let's say thread one calls this code. So thread one comes in, it news up web client, it initializes byte array result, and then it hits that await keyword. And as soon as our thread hits the await keyword, it goes away. It, it returns. And that's important, because thread one is also known as the main thread. It's also known as the UI thread. It's the most important thread in our apps, because it's the only thread that can interact with the UI. It's the only thread that can interact with the user. When the user taps a button on our app, it's the UI thread that reacts and fires off that uh, click handler. Uh, when the user scrolls on the screen, it's the UI thread that has to redraw everything on the screen while the user's scrolling. So if thread one was calling download data task async, it'd be really bad. Because if download data task async takes five seconds, well, then the user can't interact with our app for five seconds. And our app's basically frozen. And what happens when our app freezes? Well, what do they do? They force quit the app. They give us a one-star review in the App Store. They tell all their friends, don't use this app. It's crap. It freezes all the time. When really, all that's happening is we accidentally locked up the main thread, the calling thread. So Good news, with async await, as soon as we hit the await keyword, that calling thread, in this case thread one, returns. It's able to now interact with the user. The user can tap buttons. All the meanwhile, thread two, in this case, is running in the background. Now, it's not always going to be thread two. Uh, what happens under the hood is .NET just goes and grabs any thread from the thread any thread from the thread pool. Uh, we've got this cool thing in .NET called thread pools, where depending on the size of your computer, your server, your phone, whatever your app code is running on, uh, that'll determine how many threads you have in the thread pool. So in this case, we got thread two. It's running download data task async. And then when it finishes, .NET goes back to the calling thread, in this case, thread one, and says, hey, thread one, you're back up. So thread one jumps back in, picks up where it left off, and it does the encoding to turn that into a string, and then it jumps into load data. Now, we're going to go a little deeper. And to go a little deeper, we've got to see what the compiler actually generates out of our code. So here's that, here's that method again. And this is actually what it looks like after we compile. Uh, so if, if you're not familiar, um, .NET, when you click compile, it turns your C-sharp code into a DLL file. And sometimes it does some compiler-generated gener stuff for us, which is what we're looking at here. And if you ever wanted to, you can use a decompiler to take that DLL and convert it back into C-sharp code. So we're looking back at C-sharp code that was created by in the DLL file and then recreated by our decompiler. And the first thing you'll notice is 
we're looking at a private sealed class called the same as our method name, read data from URL. Now, I didn't write a class. I wrote a method. But the compiler took my async method and turned it into a class. And this happens anytime we use the async keyword. So you might not realize it, but every time we use that async keyword and we add it on that little on the method line, on the method signature, the compiler's got to work a little bit harder to create this task or create this class, and our app size gets just a little bit bigger because it generates some code for us. Now, that's all insignificant for 99.9% .9 of our projects, but just FYI, it'll add a nanosecond to your compile time, and it'll increase your app size by about 100 bytes, but I don't know if you're like me, who cares about 100 bytes, right? Like, I'm a mobile app developer, I make iOS and Android apps using Xamarin and .NET MAUI, all in C Sharp, and I, I don't care about 100 bytes, but maybe, maybe you're making stuff for the space shuttle, and it's got to be really optimized. Then you might care. What else is in here? Well, we see a couple fields, so a bunch of private fields. And these fields are actually the same variables that we created inside our method. So not only does it generate a class, but it also takes those local variables that we created and turns them into fields. So you can see there's private string data, private byte array result, private web client WC, uh, public string URL, because URL was the parameter passed in, so it's public. And something else you'll notice is these weird angle brackets and underscores. Uh, the .NET compiler actually does that on purpose, because when it generates code, it doesn't want to generate anything with a similar variable name that might already exist in your code. And so the trick that the .NET team does is it actually creates illegal file names. Like if you tried to create a field called angle bracket data, angle bracket five underscore three, it wouldn't compile. So that's how we can kind of get away with creating that, or how the .NET team can get away with creating that for us. And what else do we have in here? We've got this method called move next. Now, if I'm being totally honest with you, this is what started my journey down the async await rabbit hole about six, seven, eight years ago, because I pushed my first app to the App Store around that time, and I kept seeing these weird errors, like weird things were happening in my app that I didn't tell it to do, and I had no idea what was going on. And, and a lot of my stack traces was move next. And I'm like, what is this? I, I never wrote a method called move next, so how is this move next appearing in all my stack traces? Um, well, it's because it was auto-generated for me. And if we dive into move next, this is what it looks like, but let's zoom in. Move next is basically a state machine. So to boil that down into C-sharp terms, move next is just a giant switch statement. And it creates a case every time we use the await keyword. So in our instance here, we have two cases, and that's because in the method I wrote, I call the await keyword once. If in my method I had called the await keyword twice, we would have three cases. If I had used the await keyword three times, we'd have four cases. So every time we use that await keyword, we get a new case inside of move next, inside of our state machine. And if we look at the code, case zero, this is all the code leading up to that first await. So just like we saw earlier, it's newing up web client, and then it's calling download data task async, kind of. Uh, really what it's doing, it's getting the, this, what's called an awaiter. And not to go into too much detail, but that's basically how thread one will know where to come back. But then thread one returns. So we hit this return statement. And this is actually the magic that frees up that calling thread once it hits the await keyword, because thread one, as far as it knows, it returned. It's done. It exits the method. And now our main thread is able to go back, and our users can use our app and not have to worry about it freezing up. But before it returns, it sets that value of PC to 1. And it does that because when .NET comes back to thread one and says, hey, the background task is done, you're back up, thread one's going to jump back into case one. So it's kind of letting itself know where to pick up where it left off. And just like we expect, this is the rest of our method, where we, we get the result from download data task async, we encode it, and then we call that load data method. Now, the other weird thing inside of move next is this try catch block. And I guarantee you, 
everybody in this room, if you've written async await code, you've been burned by this try catch block, myself included. And what's, what's weird about this is I didn't write a try catch block, right? There's no try catch block in my code. This is all auto generated for us, and it's always auto generated for us. And so, what this means is if any of my code throws an exception, it's going to get caught right here. Now, the good news is if we use the await keyword, the await keyword will essentially rethrow the exception. So, when say thread one comes back to see, hey, what's, what happened? How'd everything go? Where do I pick up where I left off? It goes, oh, there's an exception, it'll rethrow it. So as long as we use the await keyword, we're good. But the biggest problem I see, and this was actually my problem back in the day when I made my first app, was we try to be too clever. You know, I was, I was making a mobile app, and just like we were talking about a minute ago, I didn't want to hog the UI thread. So I thought I was being real smart saying, I'm going to put this on a background thread by saying task.run, here's all my code, and you know what? It's on the background. I don't care when it finishes, so I'm not going to await task.run. And what was happening, what, <laughs> the reason I was getting weird behavior in my app and weird bugs and weird stack traces is that exception, or an exception, was being thrown in my code, but it was being caught here inside of move next. And because I didn't await that task, that exception never got rethrown. And you might think to yourself, isn't that a good thing? Exceptions crash our apps. I try my best to not have exceptions. And you're not totally wrong, but I would argue exceptions are a good thing because it lets us know as developers that, hey, something happened that we didn't want. Something happened unexpected. Something exceptional happened. And it's kind of C Sharp's way of letting us know, or .NET's way of asking us, hey, what do you want to do with this? So for me, my app was throwing exceptions. I was not awaiting my task. I thought I was being smart by running stuff inside the background thread, doing task.run. And all of a sudden, now my app's in this weird state that I never designed it for, I never programmed it for, and you get really, really weird bugs, all because of try catch. So let's do a quick review before we jump into some code. So the async keyword adds about 100 bytes. So every time we create a new async method, again, the compiler creates a class for us. And it increases our app size by just a little bit. But again, what's, what's 100 bytes worth to us in 2023? I don't really mind. <laughs> and then the other thing we want to remember, we want to await every task. Please don't ever do what I did. Don't ever say task.run and just let it go without awaiting it. Uh, the other really bad pattern I see all the time, well, not all the time, but way more often than we should, is people will do underscore equals task.run, like they're discarding the task. And you definitely don't want to do that, because then there's no way to get that exception back if one bubbles up. So make sure we await every task. Otherwise, these non-awaited tasks are going to hide exceptions. All right, so let's jump into some code here. And like I said, this is all, this is all open source. It's up on GitHub. If you didn't get a chance to grab that link, I'll share it with you later. But what we're going to do here is we're going to take this, this app I've created. Um, I don't know if anybody reads Hacker News, but it's a cool website I like that people can post tech news stories to. So this is just a mobile app that hits Hacker News' APIs, pulls down the top stories, and then you know, we can click on any of these, and we can read it here in our browser without having to go to the website. So what I've got here is this is a, a .NET MAUI app, obviously, all written in C Sharp. And again, don't worry about memorizing anything, because I've got this file, bad async await practices. This is the one we're going to live in today. This is the code we're fixing. And if you don't remember everything we covered, that's OK, because it's already fixed inside of good async await practice. So let's dive in. So this first refactor here, we're, we're actually we're already getting yelled at. And we're already getting yelled at because we're doing exactly what I just told you not to do, right? Uh, refresh is an async task method, and we're not awaiting it. But you know, here we are in the constructor of the class. And so you know, I, just, I just stood up in front of everybody and said, always await every task. But we're in the constructor. Constructors can't use async await because constructors aren't designed for that. The whole point of a constructor is just to initialize your object. It's literally 
assigning a slot in memory to put this object into, and then you know, we can use it to assign some variables, but you're not supposed to do any sort of long run thing in a constructor, because again, we're just initializing the object, assigning it to a location of memory. So we'll never be able to use the await keyword in the constructor, but so how do we get around this? Well, there is one cool trick here. We can use an async void method to get away from or to get away from that error. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, "Hold up! I was told never to use async void," and and you're not wrong. Um, but the problem I have with that that method of teaching, because I'm sure we've all been in a class or watched a video when somebody says, "Never use async void. It's only meant for event handlers." And yeah, if you subscribe to that, then you'll be in pretty good position. But this is actually a valid case of async void. And the problem I have when people tell us never to use it is they don't tell you why. So, so why is this code dangerous? Because if we look at it, we're, we're covering everything we just talked about in the beginning, right? Because refresh is an async task method. And we're using, we're calling the await keyword. So that means if an exception is thrown, I'll be able to, it'll surface, it'll be uh, visible to me because the await keyword will rethrow that exception. And, and honestly, this is good code. You could push this to production, but let's talk about why this is dangerous. So uh, one of the reasons why this is dangerous is if we go back to that first example where let's say thread one calls refresh. So thread one comes into this method and it hits the await keyword. And just like we learned, it's going to return. And now a different thread, let's say thread two, is running this method called refresh. Um, but what's really happening is thread one's returning to here. So thread one's going to return here to continue executing code. Executing code. Now, why this is dangerous is we've got a couple things going on here. So the first thing is this method, let's say, you know, let's say it doesn't exist right here. Like it's very much in our face here. If we were looking at code, we would hopefully <laughs> see this async void right in our face. Uh, but let's, what if it was in a different class? Let's say this is code I didn't write. Maybe it's a library, right? That I don't even have insight into what's going on under the hood. Uh, when I call this method and I look at IntelliSense and I see IntelliSense tells me this method returns void, as C Sharp developers, we're rightly justified into assuming that this refresh method will finish running before it goes to this line. And that's totally valid. You will never be wrong for assuming that a void method finishes running before it moves to the next line of code. Um, so one of the reasons this is dangerous is if we look down at refresh, you know, it's, it's getting the top stories. We have our top story collection that it's going to be adding the stories into in, in a sorted way, because Hacker News likes to sort things by points so you can see people upvote and downvote stories, and that's how they bubble up to the top. Uh, but what if here I was playing around with top story collection too, and maybe my code here is adding things, or maybe I'm clearing it, and, and now what our code, or the problem in our code is that thread one is modifying top story collection, while at the same time, in the background, on a different thread, thread two is also modifying top story collection. So we're going to get weird behavior here. And so this is one of the reasons why async void is dangerous, because there's, there's no way to await a void method. So, so we, don't, we don't like that. Um, but another reason that async void is super dangerous is, let's say, this method does throw an exception. So, We'll just hard code, throw to exception here, just to really drive home that issue. Uh, you might think to yourself, well, OK, no big deal. You know, I'll just I'll wrap this in a try, try catch block. And we'll just catch it, right? What's the big deal? That's, that's how .NET works. We just catch the exception, and we probably do nothing with it, because that's how we work in .NET. Um, but the problem with this, again, is let's say, again, picture it, right? Thread one comes into here, thread one enters the try catch block, thread one calls refresh, thread one comes down here, hits the await keyword, and now it's returned. It's left uh, the refresh method. And because we're not awaiting refresh, thread one's now back here, 
and it's just going to continue on. And now thread one's all the way down here, outside of our try catch block. Meanwhile, thread two in the background is still running this, and eventually it's going to throw an exception, but we've already exited the try catch block. So another reason why async void is dangerous is because it's kind of almost nearly impossible to catch exceptions that come out of an async void method. So <laughs> what are we going to do now, right? Um, so let's actually let's back way, way up, because we do want to avoid async void. That's, it's good advice. It's good advice to avoid using async void methods, but there are valid use cases, as we saw here. And so an option we do have and something I've created is this extension method called safe, fire, and forget. And if we dig into the source code here, because we're actually in <laughs> the library for safe, fire, and forget, we can see how it works. And what I'm doing under the hood for you is I'm taking your task, I'm awaiting it, and then I have some code here to handle exceptions. So if we jump back, for example, we could say, if an exception does happen, and let's say we'll just tell it to catch every exception, then we can handle that exception here. Um, and this is using async void. But the nice thing about safe, fire, and forget is it's really in your face. Like If you're looking at this code, you know just by seeing this method that, yes, I'm aware that this is a task. And no, I don't want to await it. I just want to send it off to a background task. And I know, so it's basically what we're saying here, I know that my thread will continue on while, in this case, refresh is running. So, so what you can do, um, again, all this code's open source. But it, I'll show you, it's also up on NuGet. It's called async await best practices. So, you're more than welcome just to come in here, copy paste the code. It's just an MIT license. It's open source. That's what it's there for. Um, but I figured, why not nougatize it? Because I'm lazy too, right? I didn't want to have to copy this code into all my apps. And so you can come download async await best practices, slap it into your app. We actually just passed over a million downloads, which is really, really cool. Uh, and so if a million people are using it, it's got to be good, right? <laughs> and, then, and then we know, again, we want to fire and forget this task. We want to run it in the background. And this is way, way, way better than what we were talking about earlier, where we would do task.run, dot, dot, dot. Task.run without awaiting it, super, super dangerous. Safe, fire, and forget, pretty cool. OK, so we're going to keep that safe, fire, and forget. And we're done refactoring this method here. So let's move on to the next one. So this is the method called refresh. This is the method that executes anytime we do a pull to refresh on the app. And you know, one of the reasons why I'm calling it here in the constructor is I want the app to automatically refresh and go get the new stories as soon as the user opens it. Like, how, how terrible of, that of an experience would it be if you launch my app, nothing happens, and then you have to manually uh, like swipe to refresh? That'd be terrible. So, so that's why we're calling the constructor. Um, but what I have here is a little trick that we do in mobile apps, because sometimes the results come back really fast, and users don't, don't believe it. Um, so for better or worse, I actually inject a task.delay into a lot of my apps so that we get consistency. Because especially with mobile apps, if you do a pull to refresh and the results come back right away, see how it just disappeared? It doesn't look like anything happened. You're going to go, oh, what the heck? And you're probably going to force quit the app and give me another one-star review. So as weird as it sounds, this is a really common practice where you know, it'll always display that activity indicator at the top for two seconds. And we do that, or I do that, <laughs> by having this minimum refresh time. And I'm doing it by calling task.delay. And then down here, I'll make sure we wait until that task is done. So even if all this code completes in Five milliseconds, that'd be insane. <laughs> but even if it does, you're still going to see that activity indicator show up for two seconds to let you know that I heard you, I did it, and we're good. Um, so, so what's wrong with this code? Well, this isn't bad, because we're going we're gonna to await this task later. So we can, we can kick it off here as like a little timer, and then we can await it later. 
Um, but something that we're missing here is I have a cancellation token. Refresh gives me a cancellation token, and I'm not using it here. And that's a bad practice. We should always be using cancellation tokens for all of our async task methods. So if we're ever writing an uh, async task method, we should give the consumer of the method the ability to pass in a cancellation token, because otherwise, how are they going to stop it if they want to? So it's always the best practice to do that. And something cool that I want to show you is we can take that cancellation token, and we can just slap it on to the end of a task. So what we're looking at here is task.delay obviously returns a task. And for any method that returns a task, and let's say you know, those library creators aren't as smart as we are, they don't know about these best practices like we do, and they don't give us the option to pass in a cancellation token, well, there's this cool extension method that lives in .NET now called wait async that allows us to essentially bolt on a cancellation token to any method that we want that returns a task. So this is really cool because sometimes developers don't. Sometimes developers don't give us that option to pass in a cancellation token, and now it doesn't matter. We can just basically bolt on this cancellation token. If, this were to, uh, if we were to cancel this token, then it would cancel this task that it's attached to. Now, all that to say, that was just kind of a convenient excuse to show it because task.delay actually does accept a cancellation token. So kudos to the .NET team on <laughs> writing good .NET code. All right, next refactor. So now what we're looking at is this method that calls get top stories. So just like we talked about, we want to go to the Hacker News API. We want to get the latest top stories off of Hacker News, and then we want to display them onto the screen. So this looks pretty good, right? Like we're calling a wait. We're inside of an async task method. What's bad about this? Well, again, let's think about what's going on under the hood. So let's assume thread one kicks off this method. So thread one comes into here. Thread one spins up task.delay. There's no await keyword yet, so thread one's still going. And we come here, we come here, and then we hit this await keyword. And now thread one returns. So great, because we don't want thread one getting the, or hitting the APIs for us, because if this takes five seconds and thread one's locked up for five seconds, making API calls, our app's frozen for five seconds. Um, but this isn't great, because even though a different thread's doing it, let's say a background thread, thread 32 is, is running git top stories. Well, when git top stories is done, remember, we return back to the calling thread. So once get top stories finishes, once the task is completed, .NET's going to go, hey, thread one, you're back up. And then thread one jumps in here, and that's what clears our collection and then runs through this for each loop. And is that really what we want? I mean, I don't, because I want thread one to be free. I want thread one to stay ready to listen to the user, interact with them, scroll, draw, do whatever the user wants to do. That's what I want thread one focused on. But as we just saw, thread one's kind of getting hijacked to come back in. So one th thing we can do, here, let's do it in line first. We can tack on configure await false. So configure await false, kind of like uh, what we saw just a second ago with dot wait async, this is an extension method that, again, bolts onto the task. So it doesn't affect the task, but what it does, it tells .NET, I don't need to return to the calling thread. It tells .NET, hey, when I'm done, when get top stories has completed, grab any thread from the thread pool. Don't wait for thread one. And this is really cool because you know, what if, you know, this is a pretty simple app, sure, but what if I made a game and there's a lot of, you know, the screen's constantly moving, I'm constantly drawing objects on the screen, really, really working thread one. Well, if I had to return to thread one, I gotta wait till thread one's ready. So if thread one's busy drawing stuff on the screen, it might be a little while. I mean, a little while, right? Like microseconds, we're talking, but a little while. We're just kind of hanging out here. Our coach is kind of hanging out. It's like, yep, everybody's ready, but thread one's still busy, so guess we'll just wait. So by tacking on configure await false, we tell .NET, I don't care. And for me, as, as a mobile app developer, uh, .NET MAUI developer, everything we do is in the MVVM architecture. So if I have any other MVVM fans out there, 
my rule of thumb is if I'm not in my view layer, so for MVVM, that means I'm in my view model layer, or I'm in my services layer, I'm somewhere where this code doesn't touch the UI. This is all business logic. So if I'm in my view model layer, I know none of this code touches the UI, then I can figure a weight false everywhere. Um, the, I'll say the one downside about configure weight false is once you learn about it, you're going to start adding it everywhere. And yeah, Denny does. And then once you, once you do, you kind of wish there was a default. But there's no default. Uh, there's no way to tell .NET, hey, let's make configure weight false the default because I've got 1,000 async methods. 9,999 of them want configure weight false. And I only want this one to say configure weight true. So I'll let you know for that one. But now we have to append configure weight false everywhere. I've been trying to poke the .NET team to get them to let us add a default for it. But until then, we'll just depend configure weight false. And again, this means that we don't return to the calling thread. So our code will execute a little bit more quickly. And in the case of this app, it free, keeps the UI thread, UI thread free to interact with the user. All right, so check that one off. Coming down, all right. Now we're in the finally block, and we're back to that minimum refresh time task. So again, this is just a task.delay that I kicked off up here. So when I initialized this variable, when I called task.delay, it started running. So this timer, this, this two-second timer started running way back here. And now I just want to make sure it's been at least two seconds before I tell the UI to stop refreshing, to remove that little spinny activity indicator at the top. Um, but the problem here is I'm calling dot wait. Now, if there's one thing you take away from this session today, it's never, 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 never call dot wait. Dot wait is really, really dangerous, and I'll tell you why. So with dot wait, what's happening here is, let's say, say thread five. We're on thread five now. So thread five comes into here, and it hits minimum refresh time task, and it's still got about a second left before. So with dot wait, what happens is, you know, like we talked about up here, normally when a thread sees a wait, it returns. It either goes back to the thread pool, or if it's the main thread, it goes back to the UI and to the user. Uh, but with dot wait, dot wait says, no, 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 no. You don't get to go anywhere. You're going to stay right here. So dot wait hijacks that calling thread and says, you stay here. And it still spins up another thread for that background thread. So now with dot wait, we have two things that are really bad. The first being, if we call that on thread one, the main thread, well, we've just locked our main thread, and now our app's frozen until this is done. And we're using two threads when we only should be using one. So even if you don't write any code that has a UI, maybe you're sitting there going, ah, Brandon, I, I make APIs. I'm a, I'm a back-end developer. Who cares about whether the UI gets, gets frozen? Well, remember, your server has a finite number of threads in its thread pool. And so if you're calling dot wait, on the server side, even though there's no UI to worry about freezing, well, every time you call dot wait, you're using two threads instead of one. And eventually, that server is going to get slammed. You're going to hit what's called thread pool exhaustion, where now all the threads are used up, and your server is basically crippled. So not only is dot wait bad, because it'll freeze our UI if, that, if we call it on the, on the UI thread, but it also cause our servers to hit that thread pool exhaustion more quickly. So, the right way to do this is just to await this task. And we can even call configure weight false here. Like I said, I, I put it everywhere in my view models, so you'll be seeing that a lot today. Um, but let me, let me just show you something real quick, because you know, it's, it's super rare nowadays. It's super, super rare. But there is still a 0.0001% chance that you might have to call dot .wait. Maybe there's an old library you're using that a developer created before async await existed, before task existed, and the only way to do it is to call dot .wait. Well, if you're in this case, and again, this should be very rare, 99.999% of the time, you should not be using dot .wait. But if we're in this scenario, what we actually want to call is get awaiter, get result. Now, this is still not great. Get awaiter, get result does literally the same thing. It's still going to hijack that calling thread. It's going to say, nope. Thread one, you stay right here. Well, I, 
spin up another thread to execute this in the background. So we're still locking the calling thread. We're still using two threads when we only should be using one. But we get better exception handling, <laughs> if that's the right word for this. Um, so one of the problems with dot wait, and maybe you've seen this, is if, if this code were to throw an exception, like, yeah, this is just task.delay. It's probably not going to throw an exception unless this token gets canceled. But let's pretend this is a, a long-running method, and it does throw an exception. Dot wait does rethrow that exception for us. So just like the await keyword rethrows the exception that gets caught inside of move next, dot wait will do that. But when dot wait throws an exception, it throws what's called a system.aggregate exception. And those are a little weird. And it's an aggregate exception is an exception that can hold exceptions. So it makes sense why the .NET team did this, because maybe there was a couple exceptions thrown inside of our, uh, in th inside of our task. So it wants to bubble up all of those to us. Uh, but for debugging, for reading stack traces, it makes things a lot more difficult, uh, especially for new developers. So if you've never seen a system.aggregate exception before, you might not know that you have to actually dig another layer into it to find the exceptions that are the collection of exceptions inside the aggregate exception. And especially with new developers, you know, those can be really tr uh, difficult to understand and track down. So if we instead use get await or get result, Again, it does the same dangerous bad behavior as dot wait, and we don't want to do this, but if we have to, uh, get await get result get await or get result is a little bit better because it'll actually rethrow our exception. So whatever exception happened in our code, that's the exception we get back from get await or get, get result. So it'll make your life easier, but in this case, we don't got to do that. We're inside of uh, async task method, so we're going to do best practices and call just await and configure await false. And if you didn't know, yes, you can use async await inside of finally blocks. OK, next on the list. So we've got our git top stories method. And if we look at it, we're making actually two API calls. So the Hacker News API is a little, a little hokey. I wish it was better. But you have to first make a call to say, hey, give me all the IDs for the top stories. And then they give you the IDs. And then you make another API call for each story that you have to iterate over to get each of them back. So it's not great. You know, why not just give it to me all at once? I just want the top stories. Like, what else is Hacker News for other than the top stories? But this is the way they designed it. Um, and ooh, something cool before I forget. This is an, a new little toy inside of .NET 8. Uh, this has nothing to do with async await. But I wanted to show it off here because I am a huge, huge fan of immutability. So when, when I make API calls in my apps and I get data back from another source, I don't want that data to change. I've been using iRead-only list, the interface iRead-only list instead of list, because that actually will store things inside of a list and you can't change it. Well, in .NET 8, they came out with this new namespace called system.collections.frozen. And one of them is called frozen set. And there's also frozen dictionary. And kind of similar to uh, a read-only list or an immutable list, uh, this, allow this will make sure nothing changes inside. You know, one of the problems with I read-only list is you could still change something if you worked hard enough. You could still you know, make a reference to something inside of it and swap them out. You know, with reference types, .NET can get a little hokey like that, and we can kind of hack our own code accidentally a little bit. But frozen set, it'll never change. So that's why I've got this here, because I want to get these top stories back up here. And I always want that pure data that came back from the API, because who knows? Maybe you got you to gotta double check it later. Like, hey, what, what data actually did come back? And if we already modified that data, that'd be bad. So welcome to frozen set. But back to async await stuff. So we're looking at this code here. And what are we doing? We're getting those top story IDs. So we got them. And then once we get those IDs, we have to iterate over them. Like I said, this, this API kind of sucks. Because now I've got to one by one get make 50 API calls to get 50 stories. So I got to make this API call, get a new story, add it to the list. I got to make another API call, get the story, add to the list. And you know, if each API call takes 10 seconds and I'm making 50, 50 of them serially, well, my users aren't going to like that. So, so what can we do here? Well, 
instead of rewriting this, I'm going to jump over here to the good async wait practices to show you something that's really, really cool inside of .NET now that we can utilize, and it's called iAsync Enumerable. So with iAsync Enumerable, before we look at the code, before we look at that rewrite, let's look at how we use it. So in the good code here, this is our refresh method again, but you know we're passing in cancellation tokens, best practices. Um, and then here, now we see this await for each loop. And this is really, really cool because if we look at the bad code side by side, the bad code, when it calls get stories, it just has to wait till all those stories have been retrieved. So again, it's just sitting there for, let's say, 500 seconds while we make 50 API calls, and then it can display them on the screen. With iAsync enumerable, we have this await for each loop. Let's make this full screen where we can basically pass in an async method. Get top stories is an async method. Um, it's a little weird because it's returning iAsync enumerable instead of task, but we can still use the async keyword. We can still use the await keyword. Um, but what's cool is once one story is retrieved, I can take action on it. And if I, if I relaunch the app here, this is running with the good view model, so the good practices. You'll see the app updates in real time. It doesn't wait for each to come back. I'm able to kick off 50 background tasks, and then as they finish, I can surface them to the user. So even if and, you know, and mobile phones are fickle, maybe you're on the bus, maybe the, you go through a tunnel, your internet connection sucks, we're at a conference where there's terrible Wi-Fi, although I think the Wi-Fi has been pretty good here so far, at least for me. Uh, we, we don't want the user just sitting there looking at it like just a little spinning indicator. It's so much better if we can start giving them the data first, or as, as we're waiting for all of it to finish, rather. So, so how does this work? This is, and this is a little weird. If you've never implemented an iAsync enumerable before, um, it's going to feel a little icky. But man, the results are so good that it's totally worth it. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is these parameters. So like I mentioned earlier, we always want to be able to pass in a cancellation token. If we're making an async task method, or even an async I async enumerable method, um, give me the option to give you a cancellation token, because if it's taken more than 10 seconds, maybe I just want to call it off. So we can still do that, but I async enumerable's got some extra logic in it that we can take advantage of. So there's this enumerator cancellation attribute. And if we assign that here as our cancellation token parameter to our cancellation token parameter, now this iAsync enumerable knows that if this token is ever canceled, stop. So and again, we shouldn't, but let's say none of our methods in here accepted cancellation tokens. So we're not, we're not doing anything with this cancellation token. It's not being used anywhere. Um, that's OK, because the await for each loop will automatically break its iteration once it sees that this cancellation token is completed, as long as we put this attribute in it. Now, should we ignore it? No. We should always pass in those cancellation tokens. So let's put them back here. Um, so keep that in mind. I think you do get yelled at. I think I'll get a, do I get a squiggle? Oh, wait. Where'd it go? If I get rid of just that part, yeah, we get a little bit of a squiggle there. So it's letting me know that you've got a, what's exactly it say? We've got a, there we go. We should decorate with the enumerator cancellation token attribute, blah, 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 blah. So if you forget, hopefully that's enough to remind you as well. Um, but yeah, if we look at this code, the way we take a method like this, where we are in the bad way, doing a for each loop and iterating over one story at a time, and turn that into an iAsync enumerable, is we basically use a list of tasks. So I, I created this new list of task of type story model, because that's, that's what my API returns back. So the API is going to give me a task of type story model. And what I do, I say, hey, for every top story ID, basically kick off that task. So kick it off in the background, like this get story right here. 
This returns a task, but I'm not awaiting it. I'm just putting all those tasks into a list because then what I do is I put it in a while loop and I say, get top story task list dot any. If that's still true, keep iterating through here. And what we get is, or what we can do is we can take advantage of task dot when any. So task dot when any, totally, totally cool. Um, what it does is you pass into task dot when any a collection. So you pass in an I enumerable. And any time, or rather, to be more specific, you pass in an I enumerable of type task. So if you have a list of tasks, you can pass those into task dot when, when any. And as soon as one of those tasks is completed, it'll return it to me. So I say await task.winAny, of course, configure a false. And I get this completed get story task here. So the first thing I do is I remove that from my list because I know it's done. I don't, need to, I don't need to await it anymore. And then I get the result from that story, and I call yield return. Now, if you're familiar with I enumerable, you maybe done a yield return before, um, but maybe you're not. Like, who, who uses yield return really anymore for I enumerables? I don't. But for I async enumerable, what yield return does, and the reason it's so beneficial, is as soon as we hit this yield return, our code jumps, boop, into this for each block. So now the yield return happens, and we can iterate on what just that one result we got back, and then the code returns back here to resume the while loop. So in this manner, we're able to kick off all the background tasks we need, and then we can show them to the user as they complete. So super, super useful. Like I said, creating a, a list of tasks is a little weird, and then await.task.winAny is a little weird. But man, the, the benefits of iAsync and Neurable, huge, huge, huge. So highly, highly recommend that for all of our apps just so we don't have to leave the user sitting there waiting for something to happen. All right. So let's pretend like we refactored that here. We're a little low on time, so I'm not going to rewrite this whole method for us. All right, so the next one. We've got a method called get story. This is calling the Hacker News API. It's getting the story. Cancellation tokens, good. Um, we're not doing configure wait false, so let's slap that in there. That'd be good. But what else could we do? Because we're using await, we're using async, configure it false. Well, something that's kind of cool here is that if we look at the return type of get story, it returns a type of task story model. And if I look at my method, my method signature, it also returns a type of task story model. And the only place in this method where I'm using the await keyword is in the return statement. So something I can do, I can get rid of async. I can get rid of a wait, and I can just return that task. Now, why is this good? Why would I want to do this? Well, let's put those back and think about what's going on again. So again, let's pretend thread one kicks off this method. So thread one jumps into get story and immediately hits the await keyword. So thread one leaves. We grab a background thread. Now thread 52 is running get story in the background. When thread 52 is done, it's going to well, in this case, we have configure wait false, so it won't return to the calling thread. It'll let .NET know, hey, I'm all done. So with configure wait false, .NET just goes to the thread pool, grabs whatever thread's free, and let's say thread 7 now returns this method. So what just happened was, with this one line of code, we had to switch threads twice. And if we can avoid that, we should, because switching threads, switching contexts, is expensive in .NET. So if we get rid of async, get rid of await, and just return that task, essentially what we're doing is deferring that context switch, that thread change, up to whoever calls this method. So wherever I got in the code, where are we calling it? Up here. So up here, where we call await get story, it's returning that task that we just returned. So, so by just returning the task, we can save a little bit on async await. Our code's going to run a little bit faster. And we got rid of the async keyword, so our code gets a little bit smaller. I mean, 100 bytes smaller, but still a little bit smaller. Now, I've got one more down here. Um, and this one's kind of similar, right? I mean, the only real difference is we've got this if statement to, you know, instead of getting the top story IDs every time, like, do they really change that much? And 
if we've already retrieved them and they've done a pull, to, the user does another pull to refresh, well, I said, if it's only been an hour, just use the ones we already got. We don't need to make another API call. So that's a little different. We've got a try catch block here, but like I was just saying, if the only place we're using the await keyword is in the return statement, we can get rid of it. And this up here will yell at us because we have to say from result just to pass that into a task since we do have to return a task. And this is good, right? No. This is actually really bad. So this is the exception. Um, so this is fine up here. But down here, we're inside of a try catch block. So if we think about what happens is, let's say our code comes in, the thread gets to here, and then the thread hits this return statement, it returns. We've, we've exited this method, which means we've exited this try catch block. So now, if this method throws an exception, we're never going to catch it here because we've already left. We've already returned. So, so we can't do that, actually. So in this case, because we're inside of a try catch block and we want to catch that exception and be able to handle it, we do actually want to return await. So most of the times, if the only place in your method where you use the await keyword is in the return statement, you can just return the task. But in cases like this, where we're inside of a try catch block, or maybe we're inside of a using block, like we're disposing of an object, make sure to keep the return await, because speaking from experience, you're going to get real weird bugs in your app. <laughs> and you're like, why didn't this, why didn't this bug get caught? I, catch, I got a catch right here. So we're going to keep this await in here. We're going to keep configure await false. Um, but what we can do to refactor this method is we can use something called a value task. Now, a value task is kind of similar to a task. On the surface, it feels super, 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 super similar. Like, if I look at the code that calls this method, I still await it. I still can basically treat it like a task. Um, but with a value task, it's a value type. So in .NET, we have value types and we have reference types. Value types get put onto a stack. Reference types get put onto a heap. And if you remember from your data structures days, adding something to a stack, super quick, super simple. You just pop it or push it into the top. Putting something on a heap, more expensive, because a heap has to be indexed. So adding something to a heap is a little bit more expensive. And the reason we can use value task here is because of this part of the code right here. So if we look at the code, the first time we call it, we're not going to have anything. Our data is not going to be recent. So we're not going to return here. We're going to come down here and call the API. But then the user does a pull to refresh. And the second time this code runs, we're going to return right away. And the third time this code runs, we're going to return right away. And for the whole next hour, the next time this code runs, we're going to return right away. And if you have a scenario like this, where you have a method, where the hot path, where something like this, where nine times out of 10, you're going to return without ever using the await keyword, you can return a value task, and you get a nice little performance bump. So you don't want a value task everywhere. If, if your method always calls the await keyword, keep using a task. That's what it's there for. But with value task, we get a little bit of a performance bump because we don't have to go through all the overhead of creating a task and putting it on the heap. And they're a little bit more complex than value tasks anyway. So we can take advantage of that here. And again, our app now works a little bit faster. Whew, OK. So let's, let's do a quick review. Like I said, this is years and years. This is like, what, 15 years of async await content smashed into an hour. So what did we talk about? Well, never use dot wait, never use dot result. We didn't show dot result in the examples, but it does the same thing that dot wait does. It's going to lock the calling thread. It's going to keep it. It's going to hold it hostage while the other background thread's going. We're going to be using two threads, and we should only be using one. So instead, we should just use the await keyword. But if in that really, really rare instance where we can't use await, we should use get await or get result. And get await or get result actually replaces both. It has the same behavior as dot wait, and it has the same behavior as dot result. So we can go through all of our code and hopefully replace, replace dot wait with await. But again, in the rare instance where you have to, get await or get result. Fire and forget tasks. So if you want to run a task on a background thread that's totally cool, I do it all the time myself, feel free to grab my NuGet package, async await best practices, and then you can use that dot fire and forget extension method. Or if your company doesn't like you adding NuGet packages, you can just copy paste the code. That's totally cool too. 
avoid return await. It's like we saw earlier. If, we're, if the only place in our method where we use the await keyword is in the return statement, we could just return the task. Except if you're in a try catch block or if you're in a using block. Again, this is totally from experience. I, I return out of a using block once, and all of a sudden, I'm getting object disposed errors because what I was trying to do in the background, that object got disposed. So learn from my pain, learn from my examples. If you're using a try catch block, if you're inside of a using block, keep the return await. Utilize configure await false. So if you don't need to return to that calling thread, configure await false will help your code run a little bit faster. There is a caveat to this. .NET has something called a synchronization context in most frameworks. Uh, so I've listed out a couple of the popular ones, or at least the ones I could think of off the top of my head. Um, and kind of a rule of thumb is, if it's got a UI, it probably has a synchronization context. Because the whole point of a synchronization context is to be able to help .NET return to the UI thread. So if you have a UI, there's a likely, likely chance that you have a synchronization context. And if that's the case, configure wait false will never return back to that calling thread. Um, if there is no config, <laughs> if there is no synchronization context, like for example, ASP.NET Core doesn't have a con configuration context. S synchronization context. Whew. So in ASP.NET Core, you can still use dot configure await false. Uh, I actually do. It's partly out of habit and partly kind of best practices because I copy paste code from a lot of places a lot. So I just want to follow best practices. I still use it in ASP.NET Core. But because ASP.NET Core does not have a synchronization context, Calling configure wait false is the same thing as calling configure wait true. They, they don't make a difference because that whole configure await is actually telling the synchronization context whether or not to return back to the calling thread. So little caveat there. Uh, value task. So again, if the hot path of your method does not use the await keyword, if nine times out of 10, the code in your method will never call await, have it return a value task instead of a task. Async enumerable, like we saw, this is our await for each loop. So for streaming data, if we want to update the UI as uh, data returns back, uh, this will give a much, much better user experience. Just keep in mind, we do still want to use cancellation tokens. And make sure to tell that for each loop, that await for each loop, this enumerator cancellation attribute to let it know that, hey, this is your cancellation token. So anytime this cancels, you're done. You don't need to keep looping. And dot wait async. So if you ever have a method where the developer just didn't allow you to include a cancellation token or pass in a cancellation token, you can just bolt on a cancellation token with this extension method, dot wait async. And it works just as if they did. So it's kind of a little workaround for us for super, super helpful for backwards compatibility. Whew. Last one, and we actually didn't cover this in the example code, mostly because I couldn't really come up with a good example in this app to make this work. But if you've ever heard of iDisposable, there's now an iAsync disposable. And it works super, super similar. So we have our using block. And just like with iDisposable, when, the end of the, when we reach the end of the using block, that object will be disposed. So in this case, we're newing up file stream. We're going to write all our code. We're saving data to a file. And at the end of this using block, the file stream will be disposed. So we're being you know, good shepherds of our memory and good .NET developers. Well, kind of the same idea with await using. So there's certain libraries, like file stream, that are kind of heavy to initialize, heavy to tear down. And we don't really want to do that on the main thread. So they've given us now iAsync disposable. And to use that, all we have to do is say await using. Treat it exactly the same. We can even, you can see at the end there, at the very, very end, it says dot configure wait false. So we can still tell it configure wait false. And then the way this works, at the end of that block, that's when it'll actually await it. So it's a little, the syntax makes sense <laughs> in the fact that it looks good, um, but it's a little weird because that await doesn't really happen till the end, but it'll still happen. So if you haven't had a chance yet, this is, this is the time. Make sure to take out your phones, grab a picture of the QR code, grab this link, because this is where you can find 
all the resources from today. So I've uploaded all of the slides from this presentation. I've uploaded a video from a previous time. I've given this talk. So you don't have to worry about memorizing anything. You can rewatch the video. You can share it with your coworkers. Um, I've also included a bunch of helpful links in here. So if you want to dive deeper into value tasks, you want to dive deeper into iAsync disposable, you want to dive deeper into iAsync enumerable, all those cool things we talked about today are on that website for you as well. Thank you. <laughs>